Yeah, okay, we're back. We came back. We came back on a Thursday at 10 a.m. And we're here with Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And we have some really disturbing news for you about things that have happened in the legislature. Welcome to the show, Tom. Oh, thanks for having me on the show, Jay. Are you as disturbed as I am? Well, it, it was it was kind of surprising seeing all the infighting that's going on. So uh, we wanted to kind of you know give you an idea of some of the backstories that go on at the at our, our large square building there on Baratania Street. Well, how about the uh, how about the gift to the teachers? I, I think it's uh, worth talking about that one. Okay, uh, today we're going to be talking about House Bill six thirteen, and uh, you know ultimately. Uh, this is how it started. Okay, it's it's a very simple bill. Uh, with, so it's what we call a short form. Uh, it it says absolutely nothing, uh, but it does have a title, and uh, that's the whole bill we're looking at. That's everything. That's the whole bill. That's what I call a short form. You can have a bill of a thousand pages or five lines. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you can't sign that one into law, but it. Uh, what it does is it gives you a placeholder in case you want to uh, introduce something later after the uh, legislature has started roll it, rolling along. And that's kind of what happened. So uh, uh, it turns out that when the legislature was rolling along, uh, then uh, there came the possibility of having a lot of uh, education aid in terms of uh, like ESSER funds and uh, you know similar uh, grant funds that would be made available by the federal government uh, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act. So uh, what the what the committee did quite properly, this is the House Education Committee, is they took uh, this short form bill, uh, had a hearing and said, we're going to amend this bill and we're going to re recommit to our committee uh, for the purpose of hearing the bill once it has contents, okay, which is which is fine. So uh, so so the bill, uh, gets recommitted and, and and there's some language then put in it uh, to uh, expend the federal funds uh, that they are that they are anticipating. Uh, specifically, they wanted to ensure uh, that federal uh, maintenance of effort requirements, and we, we've talked about that a little bit before, uh, as applied to our DOE, uh, are complied with and were spent according to the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, as at least as it applied to those at the school level. Okay, so far, so good. Um, now, uh, things started happening when this bill crossed over into the Senate. Okay, uh, the, the Senate Education Committee uh, changed those employed at the school level to those employed at the school level in the classroom. Uh, and what that uh, meant basically was teachers. Ex excluding and, everybody else in, in the schools, principals uh, and all the non-teaching staff. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that's where this, the fireworks started. Because once you had that language in there, then HGEA, who represents the administrators, the principals, the vice principals, the custodial staff, cafeteria staff, and office support workers said, Hey, what are you guys doing? You know, uh, in other words, uh, me too. <laughs> so, um, uh, so there were those in the Senate who wanted to uh, basically support the teachers to the exclusion of all else, uh, and uh, and HGEA. Uh, which of course has uh, a considerable amount of influence uh, representing lots of government workers, you know, started stamping its feet up and down. Uh, they um, uh, submitted some very incendiary testimony to the House Ways and Means Committee um, in strong opposition to the bill as it was then. Take give me an example of what you mean by incendiary. Okay, let's see if I can pull up a nice quote here. Um, uh, and here is uh, Randy Pereira talking. Uh, it's not, you know, as incendiary as it as he normally is, but he says this measure should be amended to require the BOE and Superintendent of Education uh, to implement the use of these funds as intended by the Congress for all school level employees and not limit the use of funds for classroom staff only. Uh, 
Anything less is a disservice to the many support staff who keep our schools operating and care for our students. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, sounds pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ways and means didn't change the language, it went to confidence. Okay. And then. GEA didn't have enough clout. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, I think, you know, the thinking was, well, you know, uh, we're too lazy to change it now, but, you know, we're, we're going to have a House, uh, House Senate conference anyway, because the, because the Education Committee amended the bill anyway. Uh, so let's, let's kind of hash it out in conference. Okay. So, um, so the conference committee meets and, uh, and here's one of the things uh, that they come up with. Now, not only uh, do they uh, replace the generalized appropriation of the ESSER funds and other uh, federal aid, uh, they, they get to a lot more detail. So they start talking uh, about, um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll give uh, uh, all manner of programs, uh, you know, like learning laws, uh, charter schools, uh, facilities for safe reopening, uh, software subscriptions and licenses, and even an automated greenhouse pilot program. Okay, uh, the schools of the uh, high schools in Kohala, uh, Molokai, Lahaina Luna, Kauai, Waialua, and Mililani all got a cool million uh, to do a an automated greenhouse pilot program, whatever that mm, is. Cornucopia. Hey, it's federal money, so uh, <laughs> as long as as long as it sounds good, right? Well, I want to talk to you about that, but go ahead. Okay, but then came the clincher, and here is here it is the mana from heaven. This language appropriates uh, twenty nine point seven million for the purpose of educator work workforce stabilization to retain teachers, uh, provided that. Uh, money is appropriate shall be used for a one-time stabilization payment of $2,200 uh, for each teacher. And that's what, that's what the first conference draft said. Now, um, each teacher can be fairly broadly you know, interpreted. So I, if, I'm, if I'm a substitute and I go teach uh, in one day, one day in, in a year, and, and I collect maybe 75 bucks, um, I'm not eligible for the 2200, isn't that great? Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, people kind of woke up before that, uh, that got uh, passed into law. Uh, and what, ha what, they, what, ha what they had to do is they had to amend it on the floor. So they you know, hurried up and you know, went to the House uh, floor and introduced a floor amendment and went to the Senate to introduce the same floor amendment. And uh, the floor amendments got introduced and change the language to uh, each full-time and half-time teacher. Okay. But there, but there, but there are, uh, you know, a couple of problems with that. Yeah. One is it's, it's still only teachers. Yeah. Okay. So, so that doesn't solve HGE's problem at all. Um, second, whatever happened to the collective bargaining agreement? Because uh, teachers are unionized. They get paid uh, whatever the collective bargaining agreement says. And the administration, uh, in fact, has teams of negotiators uh, and, and uh, they have a, a, collective bargaining, a collective bargaining office uh, whose sole job is to negotiate with the, uh, with the employee unions. Um, and so this mana from heaven was bypassing all of that. And and it is saying, ah, oh, let's 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 uh, you know uh, throw some stimulus payments at the teachers, even though it's not in the collective bargaining agreement. So, so they um, bypassed the whole system. Pretty much, pretty much. So, uh, so think, go ahead. So so this is the version that's being sent to our governor to sign. Um, and. Uh, Obviously, one of the comments that he's going to get is from HGEA, um, and he's probably going to be urged to veto uh, that part of the bill, uh, if not more. Okay, the um, you know the good thing or the or the uh, you know or the bad news, depending on your viewpoint, 
uh, is that this is an appropriation bill. So uh, it can be line itemed. The, the Hawaii Constitution says that in an appropriation bill, if the governor doesn't like one or more appropriations, he can line item it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but other bills don't have uh, that same flexibility, namely that when you have a you know large complex bill with you know multiple layers of tax increases, like um, what we've been talking about, House Bill Fifty Eight, the Enola Gay Franken bill, that one's either up or down. So uh, you you sign the whole thing or veto the whole thing, there is no in between mm -hmm. uh, when it's not an appropriation bill. And so this is kind of where we have it in terms of. Uh, what's being presented to the governor. What do you think he's going to do? I I think he's really have a, he's really going to have a tough decision. Um I I think um uh and I guess you know f f to a um uh in in at least one news report he you know publicly um said that he was not comfortable with having this mana come down from heaven, given the fact that he's got an office and his office is supposed to negotiate with the, uh, you know, with the unions. So he may, uh, you know, pick up his pen and, and line item that, the, uh, you know, that uh, appropriation out. Uh, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he does that, uh, you know, given the fact that we've got, you know, two titans, the HGEA and the HSTA, clashing over this one provision I, I i think if if uh you know it were you know ordinary people like taxpayers uh objecting to you know a bill or an appropriation it might not get heard you know so easily but uh you would think that um when it's hgea and hsta you know they both uh are in the governor's ear all the time so uh there's going to be some action coming out of this. What 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 it is? You know, we don't know yet, but uh, uh, at least here we've got a good chance of the veto pen being wielded. Mm -hmm. yeah, he would have to put that line item on the, his list of veto inclinations, which uh, comes out what comes out pretty soon in June. Huh? Yeah, the uh, the next legislative deadline is June twenty first. June twenty first is. Uh, the day by which the governor has to uh, put out a list of veto, uh, intent to veto list. Uh, so any bill that is not on the list is basically going to become law. Okay. Either by signature or silence. Either by signature or silence. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but if a, a, um, a, a bill is on the list, then by July 6th, the governor has to make the decision as to what to do about the bill. Uh, sign, veto, line item, uh, you know, whatever, uh, but it has to be done by July 6th. So what those would you, the, What would you do? I would line item it. If I were the governor, I would line item it. Why? Because, you know, um, as I mentioned before, that's why we have negotiators and that's why we have a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, the legislature's job is to, uh, you know, fund the agreement after the, um, uh, after the negotiations with the, uh, with the unions have been concluded and everybody's signed off on the collective bargaining agreement. If they have a problem with how the departments run or how the administration is spending their money, then you know they take that up with the administration, not with the union, because that's. Yes. Well, that, that's a yeah. That's that's um. That's how, so you lose control. You lose you lose oversight by the executive branch that way, and under the collective bargaining agreement, and you allow mm, any um, any any organization, any state uh, employee type union to go direct anytime it wants. I, I I think implicit in what you're saying, Tom, is that this would be really bad precedent. Because it would mean that the union really isn't bound by the collective bargaining agreement, and it has two bites at the apple, which is not what was intended either in the law relating to labor relations or, you know, in in the the development of the collective bargaining mechanism. 
um, to give them two bites of the apple is yeah. Giving, this is this is much a, too much power. Yeah, this is a classic case of of divide and conquer. Everybody learns this as a little kid, right? If you don't get, you know, if dad don't give you what you want, you go to mom. If mom don't give you what you want, you go to dad. And and sometimes you get what you want uh, out of the other parent. Sometimes you don't. But uh, uh, it works really well if the if if the two parents aren't communicating with each other really well. Did so, anybody anybody raise this with the union with the legislature and say, wait a minute, this is bad precedent. This is not the way it's supposed to work. Keep your hands off this one. Did anybody say that to them? Uh, not in so many words, but uh, at least not what we've seen in the in the testimony. Yeah. Uh, but of course, a lot of things may be uh, may be whispered to the uh, you know appropriate officials uh, behind you know behind the closed doors, so to speak. In the legislature, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I tell you where you know just some thoughts. I like to bounce off you about this. Um, aside from the uh, collective bargaining violation, if you will, uh, and the uh, intercession of the legislature where it shouldn't have gone. Um, there's, there's other issues too, and that is uh, the power of the unions in general in this state. I, I, first, my first question is, if this uh, manna from heaven bill had not happened, am I right to conclude that it would have gone into somehow into the general fund and the money that this, this manna from heaven bill is spending uh, could have been available for other purposes? Uh, to benefit the state. Am I right about that? Uh, mostly, this is federal monies, uh, so it has to be spent on education. Uh, and so as, so as long as you're fulfilling the purposes of the federal act that gives you the money, uh, you can you can spend it. So it can go to purposes other than other than teacher salaries, yes, but it still has okay. to be spent for education. The other, the other part of this is what is it supposed to, uh, what, uh, deal with uh, um, well, it's for the benefit of the teachers who might otherwise leave town, including part-time teachers now who might otherwise leave town. And I'm saying that, but but this, you know, if if you're in the military and your time for reenlistment comes up, and they give you a reenlistment bonus, you're now obligated to stay for the really obligated under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. You're obligated to stay for that period of time. You can't take the money and walk. Right, right. Is, so, is there anything here preventing these very same beneficiaries of the manna from heaven from taking the money and then taking off? Not at all. So, you see, that's that's why it's really important to, uh, you know, when you're dealing with labor relations at the at the uh, at the government level, uh, to go through the administration, to go through the you know through the through the unions, um, and make you know, the, whatever conditions you want, part of the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, you bargain over uh, what people get and you bargain over uh, what what services you get for the money you pay. Uh, and, you know, that's that's supposed to be the deal. Yeah. Oh, okay, so, you know, it's a real question about what this bill is really, really doing. And, you know, if you ask me, I'm just a, a bystander and observer, I say, well, this is just a, a big giveaway. There's federal money coming in. Let's glom onto it. Let's let's you know get it to our constituent members of the union as, as fast as possible in any way possible. Let's make them feel good. Um, let's take it. It's on the table. Let's take it without any real regard for education in general, without any real regard for the welfare of the state and the citizens of the state in general. Um, and this suggests that the union is being irresponsible. Uh, in merely taking the money, giving it to teachers without any quid pro quo, without any benefit to education. Um, so that that would be my you know knee jerk reaction here. Uh, and I am I am thinking that um, the union is is too powerful. The union is the only one walking the floor or doing lobbying, and there's no uh, countervailing lobby group or or um, you know party constituent who representing the, the citizens of the state. That is saying to the legislature, don't do that. Uh, this is this could be much better spent. This is just a grab. What's your reaction? No, I mean, um, again, uh, you you need to um, go through you know processes to make sure that that you've got uh, 
you know the correct people bought into it you you need to make sure that that you're getting value as a taxpayer for the money that you're putting in and and this you know just you know tossing it out the window and and uh, letting it fall to you know a select group of people that that's probably not what you want to do uh again it it's in derogation of it it, it disregards uh, the collective bargaining agreement and really incentivizes, you know, not only teachers, but everybody else uh, to play the same game of divide and conquer. So uh, at the end of the day, if this is kind of the precedent that you're setting, uh, you you may have a, an, a, a big free-for-all uh, in government as all of the unions go and, uh, you know, push, push, push uh, for non-bargain for benefits. A you know, couple in, of thoughts in, on that. Number one is, uh, I think, you know, one thing that has to be said is that if the collective bargaining process had, had been in play here, if the governor had been, um, you know, more aggressive about this and uh, seen it coming, um, and surely he could have, um, then what would happen is the Department of Education itself would have been at the table. The other thing well, is... You know, actually, the board was there. Uh, you know, the board was giving testimony to... The legislative committees, when it, you know, when it had okay. the opportunity I'll to do that. that, I'll take that. But <clears throat> bottom line is, it had no no leverage. That 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 is true. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's one thought, um, and uh, I, I'm I'm concerned that we we don't have an even playing field here. We have the unions and whoever else wants to do it. You you call it um, a a. Um, yeah, I forget the term you use, but I would call it an end run. This is an end run. You bypass the regular procedure. You just go for the bucks, and uh, if you have the clout, you you lobby the legislature, and they and they warm to it. We, we right. have to and, get and, out of that mindset. Yeah, and and you know, to their credit, uh, you know the, the the board of education, the board of education, you know that uh, uh, Catherine Payne, uh, she she's her testimony was basically, you know, look. Um, can you kind of like get out of this? Uh, <laughs> uh, she said, rather than directing the board and department on how to expend non-recurring federal funds, it's more suitable for the legislature to determine how much general funds it can appropriate to maintain as many resources at the classroom level as possible. Uh, Governor Ige proposed to give back approximately 123 million in general funds uh, to the department following the Council on Revenue's revised revenue projections, the legislature could ensure as minimal impact to the classroom level as possible by appropriating these previously unavailable general funds as necessary or going a step further and restoring the department's base budget. So what I what I get from that is, um, you know, guys, we, we really don't need that much help. Just, you know, restore our money, we'll spend it. You don't need to tell us how to spend it. Uh, you know, get your you know grubby grubby paws out of the process uh, is is uh, what I am reading into this. It may be too much, but uh, that's kind of what I'm reading into this. Well, you know, if you shake it and bake it, what happens is a, a specified group of beneficiaries get money in their bank account, and this is supposed to keep them from. Uh, What's the word? Stabilize. This is supposed to stabilize them in some way. Right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I see that as an appropriate way to manage the economy or the educational system. <clears throat> there are a lot of other needy people in the state. I mean, we do a show on, on restaurants, for example. A lot of them have gone out of business. A lot of small businesses have gone out of business. A lot of people in this state are needy because of COVID. And uh, they, they don't get any part of that money, directly or indirectly, not, not a penny. So what you do is you shower money. It's a, it's a lot of money, considering there's no quid pro quo or control of it. Uh, you shower money on one group in the community and not on others. And there's got to be better planning. It can't well, be yeah, it's... Lo lobbying a, a gift to one group. This is not the way we do a democracy. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly the legislature is there to set priorities, and one of their priorities, of course, uh, and understandably, is uh, you know uh, you take care of the least least fortunate among us. I mean, that's a legitimate priority. Um, but then you also have to understand uh, where it's coming from. 
And, and this is, I think, the part that they're having trouble with. Uh, where it comes from is you've got to take it from other people, purely and simply. And then the, the idea then is, you know, what's the science of it? Who do you take it from? How do you take it from them? Uh, do you base it on income? Do you base it on their business activity? Uh, you know, do you base it on their profits or do you, do you base it on, you know, ac activity, whether or not it results in profits? So those are, the, those are the kinds of questions that, you know, the legislature is being asked to uh, answer all the time. And uh, I, I, I really do think that uh, there really there is a danger in getting too much involved in the nuts and bolts of, you know, who is the money go to going to and when and how. Uh, we just need to make sure that the priorities are dealt with. The, the agencies are supposed to be the ones who, uh, you know, pay their employees and, and get the work that's required done. Um, you know, query whether, you know, the work that's required is getting done. Uh, but that's, you know, the subject for another show, probably. Well, uh, yeah, but I think I think from what our discussion was today, I think we can, you know, make some conclusions. Uh, and the primary one for me is that we were coming out of COVID now. Our economy has been damaged. Our workforce has been damaged. A lot of people have left or are considering leaving the state for the lack of a viable economy as it affects them. Um, this is a very compound, complex question. Uh, it requires the best thinking that we can uh, obtain from government. Uh, all parties on deck, uh, they all got to be thinking about those priorities you talk about. Uh, somebody has got to get a comprehensive analysis going of, of every element in the economy of our state. And to do it ad hoc, one gift from manna from heaven at a time, based on one lobbying group at a time, is not a comprehensive solution in any way. In fact, it's just a giveaway. And if you know, ask me whether the legislature gets high marks on that, it doesn't. If you ask me whether the governor gets high marks on that, it doesn't. But I think the message we leave, and you can agree or disagree, is that it should be line itemed, and we should all be watchful. It doesn't happen again. Yeah, we certainly need to uh, respect the process and, uh, and not micromanage, uh, which I think may be what's happening here. So uh, let's uh, you know, hope that uh, our lawmakers and our governor to do the right thing and, uh, and respect the process. Yeah, and let's hope they can develop a, country, you know, a comprehensive plan uh, to, uh, to reinvent, reinvigorate the economy of the state. That's the highest priority. It's very complex, and it goes beyond you know, what the challenges they've had before. It is critical to the future of the state. That's what we got to focus on. This is not an example of good focus. Anyway, thank you, Tom. Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I so enjoy these discussions. I think they are very important to the public conversation. Thank you, Jay, for having me on the show. Aloha.